So we are launching a very specific, very special webinar uh, about a transgenerational approach of transmission, the transmission of trauma. So what is it about? Today we are very happy to welcome Mr. Uh, Dr. Yael Danieli, whom we met in New York and who has conducted a fascinating work, a pioneering work, and we are very happy, delighted to share with you today. So Dr. Danieli is a clinical psychologist, she's a psychohistorian, and she's a real pioneer uh, in traumatology and victimology. You will have access to her website, the website of uh, Dr. Yael Danieli. She has founded the International Center for the study, the treatment and the prevention of the multi-generational multi legacies of trauma. As a director of the group project for Holocaust survivors and their children, she has conducted extensive psychotherapeutic work with survivors, with their offspring on individual, family, group and community basis. She has also studied in depth post-war responses and attitudes towards them, as well as the impact and uh, uh, the, the impact of the Holocaust had on their lives. So Dr. Danieli published uh, books and uh, articles that are recognized all over the world on post-trauma adaptation, lifelong post-trauma adaptation, optimal care and training for working with uh, this population and other massively traumatized victim and survivor populations add on reparative justice. This inventory that she created, the Danieli Inventory for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, enables a scientifically valid assessment and a comparative international study. Dr. Da Yael Daniel Lee is an emeritus di distinguished professor of international psychology at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. She has set up the first PhD program in international psychology. She has participated in the creation of all the international instruments uh, related to victims' rights and optimal care. She has also served as a consultant and expert um, with the ICC uh, for former Yugoslavia and other, uh, other uh, courts for Rwanda and other uh, international tribunals for victims and, and care. She is also a consultant uh, to South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and she's also a consultant for the Rwanda's government on the reparation for victims. She has also worked inter alia in Northern Ireland and Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have been able to discuss several times, and I really wanted to give her the floor uh, in the occasion of the Chair of Excellence of Normandy for Peace, uh, with regards to the uh, astonishing work she has done. And in 2008, Yael Danieli was appointed an, as an advisor on victims of terrorism for the Office of the UN Secretary General. So I am really happy and delighted and honored to welcome Dr. Yael Danieli, who has really um, conducted an extensive work on transgenerational justice for the victims, and there will be other topics we will build upon later. But today, we would like to have a very uh, privileged uh, moment with her in order to look at the psychological effects and uh, of transgenerational data. So Dr. Yael Danieli, we are immensely pleased to have you now today with us. Everything will be translated. Everything will be broadcast on our website, the Normandy Chair for Peace, which is a co-partner of this event. I would like to give you the floor and with your authorization when i have your authorization i will start sharing your slides 
Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, thank you for understanding the importance, the existential importance of the topic of today, uh, which is multi-generational legacies of trauma. Multi-generational legacies of suffering are as old as humankind and are integral to our understanding of human history. Transmitted in word, deed, even in silence, they have been chronicled, contemplated, and examined, both orally and in writing, in all societies, cultures, and religions, and analyzed in multiple dimensions by scholars from many disciplines. Having included over 30 populations worldwide in my uh, international handbook of uh, multi-generational legacies of trauma, I concluded that this is a universal, a universal phenomenon. A 2014 literature search on the effects of violent conflict on civil civilians and their yet to be born children using intergenerational, multi-generational, transgenerational, cross-generational, or long-term as keywords yielded nearly 600,000 records. Transmission mechanisms ranged from the biological to the psychological, to the familial, the socio-ethnocultural, to the political. Description and explanation abounded by the dimensions chosen and theoretical orientation. Transmission modes are not mutually exclusive, rather, for most individuals, they reflect some overlap and accumulative effect. Unfortunately, time does not allow me to review the many relevant studies, but I'm happy to provide several of our publications that do. Much of the recent work has focused on genetics and epigenetics. While widely investigated, research on massive trauma's impact on Holocaust survivors' offspring has yielded mixed findings. In my own attempt to make sense of the seeming contradictions, my framework comprehensively describes the complex nature of surviving massive trauma and the diverse ways of adapting to life's challenges in its aftermath. As shown in figure one, I appreciate your work showing figure one. Emily, thank you. My frameworks of reaching features are its focus on self or identity, multidimensionality, the ubiquitous that is totally covering conspiracy of silence in the aftermath of trauma and continuity rupture. As you see in figure one, which describes identity, right, and the various possible dimensions covered. An individual identity involves a complex interplay of multiple spheres or systems, including, but not limited to, the biological, intrapsychic, that means internal, familial in the family, communal in the community, economic, cultural, natural, and national and international. Please see figure two. I would like to acknowledge that figure two was drawn for me by a Holocaust survivor, Frederick Turner, whom we lost 
this year, but at the very ripe age of 98. So my theory is called trauma and the continuity of self, a multidimensional, multidisciplinary, integrative framework. If you look at the drawing, these systems, you see the systems we described before, dynamically coexist along the time dimension from past to present to future, enabling a continuous conceptualization of life from past to present to future. Exposure to trauma, right? When trauma happens, causes a rupture, a state of being stuck in this free flow. The degree of rupture, fragmentation, and disorientation is partly determined by the time, duration, extent, and meaning of the trauma for the individual, but it is also determined by the survival mechanisms and strategies used to adapt to it. The degree of rupture is further exacerbated by the trauma after the trauma, by how others respond. For example, societal indifference to avoidance and denial of the survivor's experience and the survivor's reactions to those. Elsewhere, I have studied this ubiquitous post-trauma conspiracy of silence in depth. A Dutch colleague, Kaisen, named these phenomena the third traumatic sequence in child survivors of the Holocaust. His first is before the trauma, second is the trauma itself, and third is what happens after the trauma. Simmons, a psychiatrist and criminologist, called it the second wound. Uh, it's what happens to the survivors after the trauma. For example, a rape survivor comes to the police and she's asked, what did you wear? Right? So it's the second wound in the context of crime. Others call it homecoming stress, for example, in Vietnam veterans, to, expl to explain the detrimental consequences for survivors and their offspring. The result may render, may render the victim survivor vulnerable, particularly to other trauma ruptures throughout the life cycle, as you see in figure three right, in Fred's drawing. It may also render immediate reaction to trauma chronic. In the extreme, survival strategies generalize to a way of life and become enduring what I call post-trauma adaptational styles. I call them adaptational because it's simply that the person is doing their best to adapt to life. These styles encompass those intrafamilial inside the family and interpersonal between people, psychological and behavioral coping, mastery and defense mechanisms. This victim survivors adapted as survival strategies during and after the trauma. They become an integral part of the survivor's personality, repertoire of defense or character armor. The survivor's view of him or herself, of others and of the world. That is the survivor's way of being in the world. These adaptational styles also shape the survivor's parenting and family life. And in turn, 
their children's upbringing, emotional development, identity, and beliefs about themselves, their peers, their societies, and their world, thereby becoming intergenerational. The parents' fixity or the parents' adaptational styles, thus are the child's biopsychosocial milieu that ultimately influences the severity of the child's, what I call, reparative adaptational impacts. I will explain it later. Our work then was to see if data would support this theory of multi-generational impact. To us, the important question was not if children of survivors have mental health problems, surely some do, some don't, but rather who among them have mental health problems. To gather the data, it was first necessary to create a measure of these various constructs that were tailored specifically to offspring. To validate these measures, my colleagues and I conducted a study of approximately 500 adult children of survivors of the Holocaust who completed a web-based inventory. But I would like you to just reflect, uh, if, Emily, if you put uh, slide number four, and maybe leave it there for people to think about. You see the trauma, rupture, and fixity, the survival strategies, adaptational styles, Reparative adaptational impacts. The adaptational styles come from the survival strategies. You see all of these relationships that I have just described. And it's all connected to family history and family milieu and to society. And as you see, we are looking at it along the time dimension. Maybe we can leave this on so people take it in and play with it while I describe the rest. <clears throat> I'm going now to describe the inventory. The inventory, by the way, is, it is easy to be found on the a uh, website of the International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma. It exists in many languages now and has been used across the world as we speak. The inventory had three parts. Part one measured post-traumatic adaptational styles of the parents as perceived by their children for each parent, that is both for mother and for father. Because a lot of the literature in this field is about mother and child. Uh, we wanted to both acknowledge and study both. So as you, show, as shown in figure four, which you're looking at, exploratory fact, factor analysis of the post-trauma adaptational styles yielded three higher order factors reflecting intensities of victim styles. Uh, it, it, just a second, you, you moved, uh, right? Right, I don't see what you see. <laughs> so, yielded three higher order factors reflecting intensities of victim style, numb style, and fighter style. The data revealed clear distinctions among these three styles. Victim style was characterized, as you see from the from the image as being stuck in the trauma rupture, 
emotional volatility, a lot of emotionality, and overprotectiveness. The second style, num style, is characterized by emotional detachment, conspiracy of silence within the family, and intolerance of weakness. Fighter style is characterized by valuing and maintaining Jewish identity. This is about Holocaust, but in, in, in other societies, we speak about their identity and valuing mastery and justice, right? The ability to survive under any circumstance and the, the pursuit of justice for victims. These three scales were highly reliable as shown by measures of internal cons in consistency and cross-language congruence. The survey was taken both in English, that is in North America, and in Hebrew, that is in Israel. You, uh, but in Israel, some uh, the languages could be in both. You can see the uh, the percent the percentage is uh, of the four hundred and ninety five. We had seventy eight percent English. Uh, and 20% Hebrew. Part two, reparative adaptational in impacts. I call it RAI for short. Measured Holocaust survivors' children perceptions of themselves. Please look at figure five. This construct, this is extremely important, expresses the core, perhaps unconscious motivation of the second generation to undo and repair the past and heal their parents and themselves. I chose the word impact to connote both the plurality, there are many impacts, and their multi-generational dynamics, that is their impact from parents to child, and of course from the child to his or her own children. You can see very clearly uh, in, in the image, analysis of 58 initial items yielded a final 36 item scale, that had excellent internal consistency and congruence between English and Hebrew versions. As you can see in, figure, in the figure, the Rai reflect the offspring's self-reported insecurity about their own competence, reparative protectiveness, need for control, Obsession with the Holocaust, or when you work with another group, it's with that uh, uh, trauma. Defensive psychosocial constriction, right? When you find it difficult to trust, you have to close in. And immature dependency. In a subsample of participants who were also interviewed using the structural clinical interview for DSM disorders, that's the skid. For those of you who are not uh, in the mental health field, uh, this is the Bible of the, the diagnostic Bible, right? Uh, so a subsample of participants, we gave that to. The Rye was highly related to the likelihood of meeting criteria for psychological disorder. When reparative adaptational impacts were high, almost half of the participants met criteria for one or more disorders. This compares with only 8% 
meeting criteria when reparative adaptational impacts were low. Of the skid defined disorder studies, generalized anxiety disorder was most frequent, followed by major depressive disorder, number two, and then PTSD that you know you know is post-traumatic stress disorder. This is very important for you to remember uh, because these were given to the children. Uh, a lot of the studies in the field try to see parallelism between the parent PTSD and the children PTSD. But you see, it would be a skewed finding because PTSD is really the lowest disorder among the children. Generalized anxiety disorder is number one. Depressive episodes are number two. And PTSD is only number three. Now, what I'm saying now is extremely important. Only two variables independently predicted these disorders the offspring's age, younger offspring were at higher risk, and rise, right? Our, the total number of the rise. Parent style were also correlated with the presence of disorder. The severity of offspring rise was strongly related to the parents' victim style, and to a lesser extent, to the parents' numb style. The mother's effect on the children was stronger, but both mother and father style contributed. The most detrimental situation for the child was when both mother and father had intense victim style. This effect is central to our hypothesis, hypothesized model shown in the next figure. You can see that the hypothesized model, we're looking at family history, family mil milieu, how they affected parents, post-traumatic adaptational styles, and how through that, they affected offspring reparative adaptational impacts. Part three, which is the most challenging one, uh, gathered information on four generation family history and demographic. These questions were important in allowing us to test the model in which family history and family milieu predict post-trauma adaptational style that in turn predict children's reparative adaptational impacts. Preliminary analysis of part three helped us to identify the most influential components for further analysis, please. Uh, see it again. Uh, we started with so many possible uh, fact uh, items, uh, and these were the factors that were most influential. As you see, under family history, mother's age cohort, and nature of Holocaust trauma, under family milieu, there are quite a few sociocultural setting, post-Holocaust socioeconomic status, post-Holocaust family size, survival of mother's mother, broken generational linkages, continuity in religious affiliation and practice. But let me go back to the text. The two most influential components of family history, as you see, were the mother's age cohort, whether the mother was a child, adolescent, or adult, and the nature of parents' Holocaust experiences, including internment ghettos, labor camps, and or concentration camps, hiding and or escaping. Family and milieu 
that's quite complex. As you see, in, you see an image included the post-Holocaust social environment, sociocultural setting that is living in Israel or in North America, and socioeconomic status. Number two, family configuration, especially whether one or both parents were survivors, the so-called double dose effect by Kellerman. Number three, social support, belongingness, for example, surviving parents, grandparents, or both in family size and affiliations with survivors in Jewish groups. And number four, continuity, the generational linkages that help survivors and their children maintain identities despite ruptures across multiple spheres and systems. We hypothesized that the effect of family history and family milieu on the offspring would be indirect, that is through the parents, right? That means that they operate through intensity of parents' victim style. And that in turn is what primarily affect the offspring rye. In other words, the effect goes through the parents to the child. The data largely supported this model. One of the most influential indirect effect was sociocultural settings. Participants who grew up in Israel fared better than those raised in North America. Their parents had less intense victim style and the offspring had lower rye. This result suggests that the Israeli setting buffered or counteracted some of the adverse effects of the rupture. Three of the four measures of identity including broken generational linkages, had stronger effect in North America than in Israel. The majority of Holocaust survivors settled in Israel and in North America, but while both sociocultural settings offered a new life, Israel symbolized millennial continuity and Jewish identity renewal. However, all effects of the settings were indirect. They only affected the children because they affected the parents. Only one background variable had both direct and indirect effect on the child. Broken generational linkages. This means that they were detrimental to offspring in a way that was over and above the effect on the, of the, on the parents, which made it overall the most influential background variable we study. So please look now at the next slide. Uh, you can see it's sort of a slice, right? And we here you have the mother's victim style, father victim slide. You can see the extra familial experience of Holocaust rupture, the intrafamilial transmission of Holocaust rupture, and the intrapsychic, right, internal representation of Holocaust rupture. So let me. Uh, uh, this is extremely important when you study any multi-generationally affected group around the world. Let me move to summary and recommendations. This study demonstrated empirically that survivors experience during and life circumstances after the Holocaust do indeed affect their children, a crucial question that has plagued the field for five decades. 
and do so primarily through parents' post-trauma adaptational styles. As noted above, we believe the inventory may facilitate research on both mechanisms and moderators of transmission. When combined with the analysis of stable epigenetic markers, such as DNA methylation, the Danieli inventory presents a considerable improvement of extant practice of using available personality checklists intended for general populations. Of the family history measures, internment was most strongly related to the intensities of survivors' parents' victim style, and as a result, had the strongest indirect effect on their offspring. Yet, the effects of post-Holocaust family milieu were stronger than those of family history. Taken as a whole, these findings suggest a multiplicity of influences on and off survivor parents. To understand children of survivors, we need to know far more about their family life than their parents' survivor status, age cohort, and Holocaust trauma experiences. In line with my theory, our study strongly supports a multidimensional approach to assess and treat an individual's post-traumatic status. Two of the various family milieu relationships stood out. The first was that living in Israel appeared to be reparative. As stated before, while both Israel and North America offered a new future for survivors, particularly as compared with staying in Germany, and despite Holocaust-related and other ongoing hardships, Israel was uniquely endowed to mitigate many of the long-term effects of Holocaust trauma. As Zahava Solomon observed, in Israel, the Holocaust was the legacy of all, and Israeli survivors found meaning in recreating and maintaining the ancient new Jewish state and actively defending her survival. The second key founding, finding was the apparent protective effects of continuity, a conception of life that spans past, present, and future. In our study, both measures of continuity, broken generational linkages, and continuity in religious affiliation and practice across generations, had indirect effects. The greater the continuity, the lower the parents' intensities of victim style, and in turn, the lower the child's reparative adaptational impacts. Broken generational linkages had, in addition, a direct effect, yielding the largest total effect of any independent variable. Moreover, certain circumstances signifying social support, belongingness, notably survival presence of the mother's mother and larger surviving family, likely enhanced family continuity. Indeed, a greater sense of continuity with Jewish history might be another protective factor afforded by living in Israel. Perhaps more than any other concept we studied, broken generational link linkages captures the rupture and tragedy inherent to the Holocaust. For Holocaust survivors, Nazi destruction of families and communities was the critical extra-familial 
experience, right outside the family experience, underlying the development of victim adaptational style that through subsequent intrafamilial dynamic inside the family adversely affected the children. Further, broken generational linkages became the offspring intrapsychic representation of the rupture, affecting them not only indirectly via intrafamilial transmission processes, but also directly as an internalized Holocaust rupture. Indeed, children in such families, while remembering their parents and lost families' war histories, as they say, only in bits and pieces, attested to the constant psychological presence of the Holocaust in home, in some cases reporting having absorbed the omnipresent experience of the Holocaust through osmosis. Though born after such massive trauma in societies gripped by the conspiracy of silence, they were nonetheless expected to reroot a family tree steeped in murder, death, and loss, and started anew a healthy generational cycle, while really thinking of their parents' murdered parents as their own grandparents. Focusing solely on clinical diagnosis as the outcome of interest lessens our chances of comprehending the entirety and lifelong meaning of trauma survivors' offspring's problems, concerns, and worldviews. The finding from our research supports several specific recommendations for enhancing clinical and community intervention with survivors and their offspring. The first recommendation is to take a full multi-generational history of trauma as a routine part of history taking and diagnostic evaluations. The Danieli inventory itself while developed primarily as a research tool, could guide clinicians in identifying and exploring the main features, meanings, and roots of survivors and offspring's life experiences, emotions, behaviors, attitudes, worldviews, and relationship. As the history is being taken, the principle of integration should inform the choice of therapeutic modalities or interventions. I'm speaking now to mental health professionals, but also for all of you when you think uh, in general context. While accurate diagnosis is of course important for good practice, systematic exploration of the reparative adaptational impact underlying psychiatric distress and dysfunction might better save, serve as guide treatment, to guide treatment plans. From a cognitive behavioral perspective, for example, many of the statements in our scale could be characterized as maladaptive thoughts. For example, my first reaction to a new task is I can't or I worry that others will look down on me, that are amenable to cognitive restructuring techniques. More broadly, our project points to the need for clinicians who work with this population to identify and explore the meaning and roots of their pa patients' life experiences. By combining therapeutic modalities is especially helpful but combining, but combining therapeutic modalities is especially helpful in working through long-term and intergenerational effects of victimization. The central therapeutic goal is identity healing to meaningfully integrate rupture and con discontinuity. 
The second recommendation is to construct a multi-generational family tree. Many people do that spontaneously. Yeah, they write this history of their families. And not only in the, among the Jewish people, among indigenous people, among uh, the other survivors, survivors of other massive trauma. Although constructing a multi-generational family tree may trigger an acute sense of pain and loss, it serves to recreate a sense of continuity and coherence damaged by traumatic legacies. One invaluable lead, yield of exploring the family tree is that it opens communication within families and between generations and makes it possible to work through toxic family secrets. Whether family therapy is feasible or not, and regardless of the therapeutic modality used, individuals and families should be viewed within the context of their ruptures and continuities and their interpersonal, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and religious cultural identity dimensions. A wider recommendation is to break the silence about traumatic experiences in as many contexts as possible within the family, community, society, nation, and the international community. Our study highlights the need for helping and studying massively traumatized people comparatively both in their quote, homeland, and in their respective host countries and refugees, and in their diasporas. It is therefore a clinical research and social policy task to adapt a multidimensional, multidisciplinary, and multisectoral longitudinal integrative framework in designing and studying long and short-term intervention, postvention, and, preventing pro and prevention programs. Our findings also have implications for community interventions. The healing processes that underlie the observed effect of family milieu are malleable by helping survivors recapture meaning, purpose, identity, connectedness of past, present, and future, and attachment to community and place. Faith-based institutions, teachers, community leaders, clinicians, policymakers, the media, and funders must augment the efforts of family and friends to promote the well-being of the staggering number of victim survivors and potential offspring worldwide, thereby preventing destructive legacies and protecting future generations. More importantly, our task must be to do our utmost to teach policymakers locally, nationally, regionally, and internationally, and impress upon them that the consequences of decisions they make, often with short-term consideration in mind, can not only be lifelong, but also multi-generational, and are in stark contrast to their rhetoric of making the world a safer and better place for our generations and for generations to come. The issue is not only how many resources they choose to commit to victims' care and how they are implemented, but also the untold multidimensional costs, economic, psychological, psychosocial, educational, politically to, political, to name but a few, over time and down through generations that will be incurred 
if they fail to provide for victim survivors, their families, communities, and nature, and nations, nature as well, <laughs> in the present and toward the future. Thank you very much. Bravo, uh, Yael. Un, une immense richesse. Congratulations, Yael. dear Yael. It is really a uh, great honor to have, have you with us. So we would like, of course, to you know uh, continue our exchanges. So it is really such an honor, and we need to do so much. Um, anyways, I would like to tell you, first of all, all the reactions and answers that people have, people who are following us online, I will read those questions in order to uh, be able to answer. So if you want to become a panelist uh, or share the video talk directly with Yael, do not hesitate to raise your hand so that I can, you know, put you as a panelist in order to have the opportunity to have a discussion here. Uh, so that will be really a delight. So I will Let's start with Donna Lurie. Uh, says that I am the child of a flight survivor. I am now. And I am now 70 with children and grandchildren on my own. Have there been impacts of the grandchildren and great grandchildren's? of survivors. Je vérifie si Donald, Donald est toujours en ligne. Donald, would you Donc, like uh, to, to, to take the, to, to come with us, us to, to join uh, us and, and to Yael, ask your question lively to Yale. Donald, would you like yes, to join thank, us? Yes. Uh, yes, thank, yes uh, thank you very much. It's been very informative. I uh, well recognize the um, victim style of response from um, you know, a, a long history of behavior with my mother, an admirable person in many ways, but uh, also difficult in many ways. Uh, she passed, unfortunately, in 2011. Um, I recognize uh, some of the impacts on myself, um, but I have two daughters and three grandchildren now, and I'm curious as to the extent you have studied uh, generations beyond the, the children of the survivors. Uh, well, this is an excellent question, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Donald. Thank you. Uh, the, as we speak, actually, the, uh, I'll answer both as a scientist and as a, <laughs> uh, as a scientist, let me say, some of the most the results on the it's research on the third generation comes from Israel, but some of it is being done outside. Uh, France took a long time to do research, uh, it, but maybe now it will be, I think it, it, it has begun uh, with uh, one of my colleagues who even used this inventory, but, uh, but it mostly on the children. Uh, the results we have, uh, and I'm giving you a very impressionistic results, is uh, that grandchildren uh, seem to be to show more anger than others. Uh, now, I cannot speak from my own study because as we speak, uh, the inventory is being adjusted for the third generation. And when we have those results, I will please be in touch with us, be in touch with our center, and I will definitely get back to you and report to you. <laughs> but it would thank be you. nice to keep in touch. So thank, well, thank you, you so much. much. Yes. Thank you. Thank Can't you for stay. your question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And the one thing I do want so, to say, that just like you, your mother had, was a victim and had no control of 
how she behaved in some ways. She certainly, I know, the kind of love in survivors' families. Uh, uh, it, it, children of survivors, unless they make it their business to become aware, they also might unconsciously transmit. So break the silence, break the silence, break the silence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Excellent question. Oui, je vais continuer Thank you. Sur la, la question de Donald. Merci beaucoup, Donald. Donc, Mary Blanche. Thank you very euh, much, Donald. So, Mary et, Blanche. So, just wanted to tell you that the webinar will be recorded. It will be online in French and English on the uh, website of the Normandie for Peace, as well as the website of the Institute. The International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma. Tout sera diffusé, on, uh, suivez nos réseaux sociaux. Alors, je voudrais profiter de la traduction simultanée pour Everything will be broadcasted uh, on our social media. So, I thought the webinar was fascinating. Uh, Thank you very much, Yael. What we see when we look at this transgenerational approach to trauma, is the multidimensionality uh, from the individual cell, the family cell, to the international community, and this continuity of this uh, transgenerational heritage. So the fact of being in the world I would like, Yael, if you could explain this transformation, this scientific revolution, which was to say that there could be some epigenetic transformations related to trauma, because not everybody knows what this means, the epigenetic inscription and the uh, transmission, the uh, intergenerational transmission. Some people might say, is this a psychological uh, transmission? Is this in the DNA? Is it a family transmission? So how can we tell this to a wider audience? How can we disseminate this to a wider audience? This notion of transmission. Thank you very much for this question. Actually, if we look again at the first uh, at the first uh, uh, picture we showed, uh, the, the very first, <laughs> exactly, as you see, uh, it, it, it works on all layers, you see, biological, intrapsychic, interpersonal, family, social, community, ethnic, cultural, religious, spiritual, environmental, political, national, international, and these are very few. These are very few. I don't have a legal here. I, I, whenever I look at it, I can think of at least 20 more mm -hmm. dimensions that are affected. We are talking about life. Exactly. And you know, Yael, uh, pardon, I'm going to switch in French. Um, when I listen to you, Yael, because I do uh, dynamic legal epistemology in order to analyze transgenerational law, and I feel we have a, a dynamic psychological epistemo epistemology, which is also cross-generational. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe uh, we would need to also use uh, artificial intelligence to put um, it in 3D and with a dynamic aspect. Maybe this is a, a depression I have. I would like to come back to one person. Um, let, let me just, let, let me, if Dean I can, I, 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 I would like to, to ask you, just to clarify the issue of the epigenetics, because yes. I know people are both very attracted to it. And, uh, and feel mystified by it. So um, I was the very last person to be surprised by the findings that a trauma such as the Nazi Holocaust has effects on our epigenetics. Of course, my God, it traumatized everything about the life of people. 
how else? Uh, so, uh, but, but let me demystify one aspect or two. One is, um, so, so, so number one, still to say, I still view the epigenetic findings simply as another substrata, substratum, where that is affected by these horrible uh, events that we keep, we keep uh, exercising in this world instead of making it better to make it worse. But number two, uh, it doesn't mean that the gene itself means that you are also traumatized. It means you have a vulnerability to potential future trauma in your own life, if it comes, okay? So this is one layer of it. And the third layer, which is very important to everyone to understand, I believe deeply, and I believe, and Rachel Yehuda, my colleague who had the findings of the, of the epigenetic, would agree that therapy might protect one against that. Okay, so, uh, so don't walk around frightened, please. Uh, look for ways to augment what we've learned. So I hope this helped a little bit. Uh, because I know I was very, <laughs> having worked for 50 years on this in the field, I was a little um, astonished when, when epigenetics became the most important finding, because I've been seeing this for 50 years. Uh, it's almost like people think that if it's in the genes, it's real. It's real in every dimension. Please don't, don't minimize the importance of all the other dimensions just because of the epigenetic finding, even though it is extremely exciting indeed. Thanks, sorry for interrupting, but I think that this needs to be stated today. Thanks, Emily, go ahead. I think it was important to come back on this because often, Yael, you uh, talk about complex thinking, multidimensional thinking, transgenerational thinking. This is a pioneering way of thinking. This is very innovative. But of course, the Western type of thinking is a more simplifying type of thinking, which is more in silos, more a binary type of thinking, which is why I really wanted you to specify the question of the epigenetic transmission of trauma. We have now Mary. I would like to give her the right to talk because she has asked for some, some questions. So if she wants, she can uh, have the floor. Otherwise, I can read questions yes Mary. yes thank you it's such an excellent beautiful presentation and i'm so honored uh to hear it i'm indigenous from canada and her theory speaks to me very deeply and i was interested to know if there's a publication on this and i would like to know what are the healing and interventions thank you Okay, yes, there are plenty of publications. You can find all of them in the International Center for, for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma. We have the most comprehensive library of publications of any discipline, um, including playwriting, poetry, uh, but, but all the scientific publications on a daily basis. Our library gets everything. So you can find all of it there, but you can also write me directly, please. My email is the simplest email on earth. It's Y-A-E-L-D for Danielle at AOL.com. And if you have an, a question about references, just Feel free and I will send it to you. Whoops. Oh, yeah, here it is. Thank you, Emily. That's very friendly. Thank you. 
This is our beloved website. And uh, I would like also uh, uh, to, to emphasize on the, the fact that NCP has exactly a strong interest on this transgenerational legacy of trauma is specifically for indigenous people. So we will absolutely make yes. online. Yes, and we have we have over a thousand publications related to indigenous people. Actually, we have all of the scientific ones, plus every day we add more and more. That is what connects Emily and myself in this very exciting existential uh, uh, field. So now there is another person who's asking the floor. It's Blanche. Excuse me, I'm doing several things on the same time. So I please uh, apologize because it's a little bit difficult for me to promote everybody on the same time. So mm -hmm. people understand. Uh, Marie, uh, Blanche, sorry, Blanche. And then there is uh, someone else who was asking also. Hello, Blanche. Blanche, uh, you can ask directly your question to Yael. Hello, I was wondering, you did the study on, uh, on people um, who had made a new life in America or in Israel. Do you have any studies on people who remained in Europe? And what is the uh, generational effect on people that had stayed at home in Europe after the Holocaust? Yes, thank you for asking, Lance. Actually, a colleague of mine used the inventory in Hungary, Vera Bekesh. So she studied both second and third generation uh, children of survivors in Hungary. My colleague Bruno, I, I'm sorry, Bruno, if you're here, please speak. I invited you to come. Uh, th th uh, actually, uh, did it in France and has very interesting results, but not along the line. He didn't use the methodology that we used. He found um, uh, th that the silence being very prevalent. Uh, it, he, uh, so if you want to be in touch with him directly and write to me, I will write you back his contacts. Uh, in France, and another colleague of mine, can you believe her name is also Daniele, uh, in Italy, is studied in Italy, <laughs> of the whole world. I found another colleague whose name is Daniele, Morena Daniele, studied Holocaust survivors' children in Italy. So the answer is yes, uh, but also know that this has been used in Kosovo, in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, in uh, it's now as we speak being used in Ukraine, uh, and, and in Germany, in Poland, uh, uh, on and on in Brazil. Um, so yes, uh, but uh, yeah. So <laughs> I hope I answer it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, now there is Dean Atrukovic who would like to ask a question. Do not hesitate to introduce him. Dean is a member of our board. Hello, Dean. <laughs> Hello, Yael. Thank you for this, uh, again, outstanding talk, really. Thank uh, you. My, my question is about um, one of the three uh, survivor styles that you have identified in your studies, and this is the fighter style as I would say, uh, more, most healthy. Uh, and I suppose that survivors who have ended up in Israel were more prone to such style and, and of course the environment and everything else. So my question is, um, how do we work towards enhancing this kind of style among the survivors of the ongoing or more recent mass trauma and I have on my mind the children of uh, the ongoing uh, uh, suffering uh, and atrocities in Ukraine. Yes. Um, 
This is an excellent question, as usual, Dean. Uh, I, it's very interesting that you assume that the fighter style is, quote, more healthy, uh, because our finding was basically that it has no, it doesn't trust anything, bad or good. Uh, but what you're saying, and identifying correctly, that identity healing, that uh, respect for oneself, for mastery, etc., is part of identity healing. Um, so, uh, yes, I believe, uh, and actually, as you know, we are working with Ukrainian colleagues uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and with many other groups. Um, to answer superficially, because this takes a whole, why won't we have a webinar just on that? Um, if you look in, in, if you look in detail, and you can find it on our website, the Daniele Inventory, there's no secret, it's open to the world in many languages. If you look at the Daniele inventory, part two, right, the rye, the effect on the children, uh, that really gives you a comprehensive picture of the child, how the child describes him or herself. And that gives you a nice picture to work with and what to focus on. Uh, especially with children. Uh, but more importantly, look, if we don't help parents in refugee camps or in refugee uh, different stages, um, we are not helping succeeding generations. A lot more help should be given and support should be given the parents. Not only children should not only be given little animals, you know, to hold, but education. There is a way to enter respect for one's culture and one's heritage in the camps, even under the horrible conditions that hap are happening. So there are ways, but let's do a special webinar on that. We are doing it any. We are doing the work anyhow. So thanks for your idea and and uh, yeah. In fact, it's perfectly quelque chose dont on va, on va pouvoir euh, discuter, euh, de faire euh, d'autres webinariels, parce que moi, je vois plusieurs choses déjà. Sorry. Je, je vois plusieurs so we have many de, ways la, to la consider à, à, all à these highlights vous, you described Gaël. today. So we have policies, we have rights. Now that we've identified psychological mechanisms, we still have in mind the role of, you know, politicians and also uh, the laws, regulations, because of course, uh, law understood that family was the first cell of society, but then still is avoiding to work on this impact and these traumas. So we have so much to do in France. We are still in this period of time. We are, you know, denouncing uh, a lot of, you know, crimes, and, uh, women's uh, violences, or violences against women and so on. So we, we, we are fighting you know, in France, at least, I don't know how it is in other countries, but we want to struggle and to, uh, you know, give those rights to women. But now, if we highlight this transgenerational law, the impacts on children, 
which assist to those violences could be on, from the mother or from the father or in the, the, from the fathers to the mothers. Anyways, it, it's really, you know, terrible to enhance then a vast footprint, which is psychological. And you, you, you just, you know, have this trauma on children. And then also, what about Po you know, politicians, because we, you've been working also in South America, work on dictatorships and uh, dictators. Um, so uh, my parents also lived in Chile uh, during upheaval. So also my mother suffered from all these traumas from the war. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I know what this silent conspiracy you were dealing with is until 15 years old. I didn't know anything about what happened in Chile. Chile. So, but we had, you know, this heritage. So this is why I completely, uh, you know, uh, understand your point and I have uh, this sensibility you're talking about. So shall we say we have like 40 years of study, Yale, and then we have now this opportunity to, uh, you know, dwell on what we have studied because we cannot say anymore that we are lacking you know, these aspects or lacking uh, this uh, source of knowledge because we have a lot of witnesses, we have a lot of generations, you know, denouncing all these uh, disorders or traumas. So what about the responsibility from society, from politicians, from the states, from the nations? Because we can see that also in Ukraine. Of course, these generations uh, now will have traumas, you know, because uh, we have these camps uh, where we have refugees and we have all these children, uh, you know, suffering from that. So what about the state? Shouldn't the state be able to protect its citizens? Shouldn't we have then a responsibility which should be taken by the states and by politicians? Considering, of course, all that knowledge we've been, you know, talking this uh, afternoon. Uh, yes, uh, let me first, uh, Dean, you are still there, yes? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Well, let me just give you one example, and then, uh, Emily, uh, of course, we go to, to your important uh, uh, comprehensive qu uh, comment. Uh, I'll give you an example, okay? If you look at the, at the Daniele inventory, and you see in the right... The, the, you know, the issue, my first reaction to anything is a cat. Okay, it's one of the items. Okay, uh, so to answer your question further, when you talk about the, the fighter style, yes, competence and mastery are very important. Okay, it's interesting. We should talk about it anyhow separately. But if you can... It, 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 let me give you an example of how this item came about. Because, of course, each one of these items were not my inventions. They were statements by children of survivors, thousands of children of survivors that I have and others have written about uh, and heard in therapy and in other conditions all these years. Uh, now, what do you do when you're confronted with Oh, I can't. It's uh, uh, not too much. You know people like that, okay? No. Um, uh, it, how do we help a person believe that? One of the ways is, for example, to remind people that when they came, for example, when the survivors came to America, they didn't know the language. They chil the children grew up, they knew English better, of course. And let's say the parents received a, a, a letter from the consulate, from the German consulate or whatever institution that asked them to respond. And the only one in, at home who knew the language was the, the, the child. So the parents said, what does it say? And what do we answer? Of course, 
a four-year-old doesn't know the answer and gets totally panicked. At the same time, they will do anything to help the parent because they love them and they want to repair the parent's life. Uh, so so the, the root of the experience of I can't uh, comes from very early in life. Uh, and so one way of explaining it today or in therapy is to bring the context to the child and said, you're absolutely right. As a three-year-old, you couldn't write a letter to the German counselor. At a four-year-old, you could not sign a check. What about what's going on today? Okay, so um, there are ways. We do have ways, but they involve a little more in-depth inquiry, etc., as we do in good therapy. But uh, Emily, um, do you? <laughs> I have just, and Dean, for both of you, we are working with, the, you know, June t uh, 20 is the International Day of Refugees. So indeed, we want to have a webinar on refugees. Uh, and it has to be international, of course, uh, not only Ukraine, but the experience of Ukraine is, is essential. But one of the things I've learned preparing for, for th this idea, and Dean, please be involved in, in, in planning this, um, that governments in Europe are not responsible for the refugees. This takes me to your question, Emily. The governments are not involved. It's the UN, uh, UNHCR, for example, or ICRC and other NGOs, either local or international. Uh, I have not even given it enough thought as to what it means. Okay, but it makes the it makes the the question of uh, decision makers' responsibility even bigger. Because one, one, night, one thing is that it's very nice that people in Poland, in Moldova, all over in Germany open their, their homes to, to, to Ukrainian refugees. Too bad they don't open their doors the same way to others. That's another issue. But some do, I know. But it's not the government. What about it? So uh, so the issue for you, Emily, would not just be the law, but who applies it, <laughs> right? Who implements, even if we have, even if we create the whole system of laws, who implements them? Who is responsible for implementing them? Uh, one, a very nice thing when one human being helps another, that's perfect anywhere, wonderful. But you're talking about a different level of mm. yeah. So we have a lot of challenges uh, when we speak about who is truly responsible. <laughs> So this was really uh, passionating. I would like to give the floor to the persons who are uh, online. So who would like to join us in order to exchange with Yael? So please. À vous féliciter, à vous remercier uh, chaleureusement pour tout ce travail que vous avez mené et qui est un, un leg important. And also, thank you for this excellent pour, uh, work. And I think we'll Avant have, I mean, we need to make cross, uh, you know, readings about the transcriptions in the law and, you know, all these aspects. And next, the next webinar, I will be. Uh, make with Leslie Clou, who is uh, in head of the research for uh, indigenous people. Um, so I would like to organize a webinar specifically um, with the transracial uh, linkage on trauma, specifically on, in, in, on indigenous people. And in that framework, you know, we also need to deal with the territory, the belongings of, of, of 
of those communities to a certain place and that will make part of uh, also current event because Vatican is also developing uh, the abandon, I mean, uh, the abandon of discovery and all the work I've mean, been, uh, you know, dealing with is extremely important and how we can highlight and implement the abandon of this uh, discovery aspect in that new uh, century. So is anyone uh, willing to take the floor before uh, closing our panel? So, yeah, this is the end of our uh, first webinar. It was a great honor and pleasure to uh, be with you, to have your presence. I would like to, to thank the interpreters, uh, by the way, for their help and support. So, anyways, you can contact us uh, here at the Cher of Normandy, but also you can contact Yael if you have any uh, other questions. And, of course, we'll answer your questions. So, Yael from Normandy, we would like to uh, greet you with a big hug uh, to you. And thank you so much. Take care, uh, Yael, and see you soon. And thank you also to all uh, the uh, participants of our webinar. So, thank you so much. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, dear. Take good care. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A bientôt. Au revoir.